first thing you think of when I say two dead men talking? Do you think of a conversation between ancient scholars wondering if the earth is flat or round? Or do you think about two men being raised from the dead, having a conversation about their life choices? Our story today talks about two dead men talking, but they're not being raised from the dead. They're, one is in heaven and the other is in hell. In the Gospel of Luke, chapter 16, verses 19 through 31, we hear the story of a rich man and Lazarus. The rich man is often dressed in fine purple cloths. He steps out of his house every day into wealth and abundance, and at his gate sits this man named Lazarus. We don't know much about Lazarus. Maybe he started off rich himself, maybe not. All we know is that Lazarus is poor and he begs for food and he would love even the scraps that the dogs outside of the rich man's house were able to eat. We know that the dogs outside of the rich man's house licked his sores and that the rich man continuously ignored his presence, his humanity, his existence at all. Both Lazarus and the rich man die. And when they do, Lazarus is carried up to heaven and the rich man is sent to Hades. After they're dead, the rich man is able to look across this chasm, this space between heaven and hell and say, Abraham, if you'll only send Lazarus to dip his finger in water and touch my tongue to relieve me just for a moment from my anxiety and this angst and this torment that I'm in, I would be so grateful. Abraham responds to him, that's not possible. There's this distance, this chasm between us and one can't pass from one to the other. And then he says, well, if you could send Lazarus to go talk to my brothers, maybe that would change their ways and they would repent. Abraham says, your brothers have the ancient scriptures. They know what they should be doing. And for them, even if they saw a dead man come back to life, it wouldn't change their ways. What he points out there is that even a miracle could not change the ways of greed and selfishness. Because even in death, the rich man doesn't care about Lazarus. He only cares about himself first and then about his immediate relatives. So what does that mean in the season of ghouls and ghosts and dead men walking? Maybe it means that we should really pay attention to the lessons in which we've been taught from our elders who've gone before us. Maybe it means we should read a little bit more carefully the wishes of Jesus and our ancestors like Moses and Elisha. Or maybe it means that sometimes we have to change our perspective, to be able to see something in a different light. Abraham talks to this rich man as he's in hell and the rich man can see almost like looking through a window, being able to see the thing that he wants, the thing that he had in this world, but isn't able to have now. You know, that feeling of pressing your face up against the glass looking outside, hoping to be out there. But for some reason, whether it's too cold or whether it's not open yet, you can't get in. That's the feeling that not only this rich man had in hell, but Lazarus most likely had in his life. He was steps away from abundance and wealth and goodness that he couldn't access. Oftentimes we read this passage and we think, it's a clear lesson. Rich means hell and poor means heaven. But it's not that simple. There's something deeper there. There's something else going on. Lazarus is a man in which we know very little about. He could have been an amazing person. He also could have been terrible. But the lesson comes in the response to the rich man as he's in hell. Not even a miracle would change their minds, says Abraham. What in our lives could not even a miracle change our minds about? Have you ever had to learn something the hard way? 
And I mean, the thing that was told to you, you knew what you were supposed to do, but you just had to push the limit. You had to find out for yourself that you were going to be punished or reprimanded or that something was even bad gonna happen because you broke the rules or did what was not asked of you. That's the same thing that's happening with this rich man. He's been told by the scriptures, he's been told by those around him that neglect of one's neighbor doesn't have a good end. But his selfishness overtook him and his perspective of this life overran any thoughts of what could happen after. He was living for that moment, for that immediate feeling of gratification and his own personal care. And even when he's dead, he cares nothing about Lazarus. He cares nothing about the person who he watched suffer daily. And maybe he didn't even watch. Maybe he put blinders on as to not see the suffering of others because it wasn't his problem. It wasn't his issue to fix. So oftentimes we put on blinders in this world because things aren't our problem. They're not our issue to fix. They're not ours to care about. But Jesus very clearly says, your neighbor is everyone and their sufferings are your responsibility. To neglect one's neighbor is to neglect Jesus, says in Matthew 25. You fed me when I was hungry. You clothed me when I had no clothing. You housed me when I had no housing. And the response is, well, we never did that for you, Jesus but you did it for the least of these. You did it for other people around. Think about something that you feel so strongly about in your life that you were convicted you are correct. Convicted, like no one could convince you on this earth that you were wrong about. Now take out the trivial stuff like the sky is blue and trees have roots and all of those things. Think about the moral convictions you have that you're so convinced upon that nothing could change your mind. What if a miracle happened that showed you a contrary position to that? Could it change your mind? Could Jesus change your mind? This parable shows us that for some of us, we're so convicted in our own factuality and our own correctness that not even a miracle, not even Jesus rising from the dead could change our minds. What is that for you? Take a moment and examine that for a moment that could be your rich man moment. That thing that you're so convicted about and couldn't change your mind about could be something in which you are living based upon your own understanding instead of the understanding of God, the understanding of others the understanding of a whole collective that brings us together. What thing is on the inside of that window that you're looking at with your perspective, but you don't know what it looks like inside the room? I would challenge you to look bigger. When we look into a window, we see one perspective. Just like Lazarus is looking down at hell and the rich man is looking up at heaven, we see one perspective. But when we're able to set our pride aside and walk in the door, we see greater things. And for greater things as to what God is calling us to. To greater positions of help and care for our neighbor is what God is calling us to. So not only does this parable highlight the harm of neglect, but it also highlights the harm of narrow-minded selfishness. Let us lean into exploring our world, exploring other people and the things they have to offer. Because if we close ourselves off so tightly to our perspective through the window, we'll never see the greatness that's beyond. We'll never see the fullness that God provides in other people other experiences, other perspectives. Instead of waving through the window at the thing you're so certain exists inside, take a step in the doors and see for yourself. See the people who are there to challenge you, to celebrate you, to love you, and see the ways that God is moving in spaces you could never imagine. 
take a note from these two dead men talking. You don't know everything and neither do I. The world is expansive and God's offering it to us. Take care of your neighbor and listen for more than just your own voice. Amen.